Hi, good evening, everyone. Hello. So, um, Bete Shoma is from the, she, she's my, she's my Goethe Institute sister. Um, so the two of us kind of uh, run the circle. And uh, since it's seven, I think I can start. Shoma, I'll, I'll just introduce the sister library. I'll introduce Bete. And then if you want to say a few words, you can, uh, you can, good evening, Mushra. Um, you can say a few words and then maybe we can, the new members and, and old members can just say a few words um, and then Bethe, you can, you can start. Um, hi. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, it's a pleasure today to have Bethe Adriance. Am I pronouncing it right? Pretty good actually, <laughs> yeah. So it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for coming to DACA. Thank you for um, having me. So the Sister Library is an ongoing art project. Welcome everyone. Um, it's, uh, it was started by Akitami in Bombay and it was started like an intervention project where she, she created a, a physical library which collected works only by women. And Aki actually only reads women. Um, I think like uh, for the last six years, she hasn't read anything uh, by, by men. And uh, so, she, so she took it to that level. Um, but she started this beautiful place and it, 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 it became uh, like a hub for, for zine making, for, for celebrating female excellence and for reading. And uh, earlier in 2020, uh, Aki came to Dhaka, brought by the Goethe Institute, um, and she brought 100 books with her for one week. And they were on display at the Goethe Library. And, uh, and then we did a couple of readings together in a circle. And, uh, and we saw that, that this can be a, a chapter here. And we've been doing readings since then. Um, since COVID started, we, we started doing them uh, digitally. And the way that the circle works, it's unlike a traditional reading group where you read a book uh, from start to finish we can only read uh, excerpts. Um, so usually we have an elder sister um, who kind of uh, chooses the book and chooses the passages that are read and, uh, and guides the reading, guides the discussion. Um, today, uh, Beth Adrianz is, is the elder sister and she's also the author of the book that we will be reading. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it from my side. The way that the circle works is anyone can read and anyone can listen. You're, you can read for as much as you want to and, uh, and stop and pass it on. If you want to read, you raise your hand. Shoma and I will moderate. Um, and yeah, welcome. Tonight we're reading A Roost Like Everyone Else. Um, Shoma, if you want to say a few words from the Goethe, go ahead. And then we'll, 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 we'll start. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Katerina. This is uh, really nice to start with a new year, with a new um, book. And very happy to see you, Vete, here, and also other uh, friends we have. Uh, and to Goethe Institute, we are very happy and uh, lucky that we have a good circle for reading uh, uh, women books here. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Let's enjoy. Would you, would you like people to introduce yourself themselves? So, so we, we do a quick round? That would be really nice, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so who wants to start? start? Just, just go ahead. I see. Um, yeah. I can start? Yes, yes, please can jump I'm up. Khadija Abzal and I've just joined. This is the first time I have joined. So I'm with the reading circle. And we are a, 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 a club, book club. We read, uh, we select a book and read it and meet once a month. But in these COVID times, we are now meeting uh, on Zoom. And uh, we have had several uh, meetings at the Goethe Institute also. And that's how I think we are on the mail email list also. 
So this is my first time. I'll I'll just listen today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Khadijapa. Thank you for coming. Maliha, do you want to start? Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? My name is Maliha Nusrat. Uh, I read in class eight. I'm from Oxford International School. So yeah. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, Nargis, would you like to introduce yourself? Is it audible? Yes. Okay, so sorry I have logging with my mother, Sikan, but my name is Nusra Jahan Bahalabi, and I'm also from Oxford International School, Class 7. Thank you. Welcome. Labiba? Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Okay, I'm from Daily Star Books and I will be covering this event for tomorrow. Thank oh, you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Bushra? Good evening, everyone. I am Bushra Mahmoud uh, and I'm reading class 10 in Oxford International School. Thank you. Welcome. Ravita? Hi, uh, so I'm Ravita. I am a um, software engineer at Cholpuri, which is a sister concern of our story. I work with Kat. Um, I'm also a writer, and this is like my outlet, or rather my inlet for all sorts of creative things. I love this um, platform that we have. Uh, and I know I'm speaking a lot, but um, it's actually an honor. I've never read a book with the author present there, so it feels amazing, to, like it's daunting somehow. <laughs> to have to be able to do that, but I'm like absolutely honored. And also it's great to see that we have like younger people joining. That's amazing. Thank you, Rebita. Uh Nofel, I'm sorry if I'm mis mispronouncing it. Nofel. So good evening. I'm Nofel Anma starting currently in the eighth grade in Nosa International and that'll be all. Welcome. Um, Soha. Hi everyone, I'm Soha Noor. I'm from Oxford International School and it's my first time in the sister's library and I'm obviously looking forward to the station. Welcome, Sh uh, Sheikh. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Sheikh Hussein and I'm also from Oxford International School and I study in grade seven. And this is my first time at sister's library, so I'm hoping uh, good. Welcome. Um, Taryn? Taryn, you're, you're on mute. Okay, maybe Siti, you go next. Uh, yeah, uh, good evening. I'm Shithi Nurhaliza from Oxford International School as well. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to this program. Thank you. Welcome. And Aisha? You're on mute. There we go. Hi, I'm Aisha. I'm from Seventh Grade. Uh, Oxford International School. I'm very glad to be here. Welcome. And Sifat. Hi, I'm Sifat. I'm a businesswoman. This is my second time uh, joining this reading circle. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Welcome. So we have a lot of uh, a lot of students today. That's exciting, Bethe. Mm -hmm. I'm not <laughs> Um, so I'll just I'll just explain our connection. Bete is is not only an author; she started a, a foundation that's very similar to her story foundation, where she connects scientists and artists and storytellers, and uh, and and to create um, content that that is is inspiring uh, for for women of all ages and men also. Um, and that's how we connected. And, uh, and then I took this opportunity to invite her to lead the circle. And it is an honor to have the writer with us. And uh, please, Bete, 
introduce the book and introduce your, your journey. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Katarina, for inviting me. And thank you to the Her Story Foundation. Thank you for, to Goethe Institute. And nice to meet you, Shoma. Thank you for having me. And everyone, thank you for introducing yourselves. It's kind of nice to know uh, who you're talking to. And for me, it's an honor to be here. The book that I'm talking about is called Rust Like Everyone Else. It's written in English. I'm Dutch, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, but after going to art school in Amsterdam, I decided to study uh, creative writing, a master's at Oxford University. And from that moment on, I wrote mostly in English. So this book came out first uh, in English. There's also a Dutch version that I translated that came out later and it came out in the UK. Uh, but I've never done a reading before in uh, Bangladesh. So even though it's online, mm -hmm. this is cool for me and it's new. So thank you for, uh, for being here. Um, the book, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the book and how it came to be. And Katerina also asked me to make the link to the foundation I started. So I'll tell you a bit about that as well. And then I think I will read the first chapter and then I will ask you uh, if you would like to join in the reading. So this book, uh, the title Russ, like everyone else, Russ refers to the main character. Um, and he uh, is a man who lives in a city that's much like Amsterdam in an illegally built apartment on the roof of a two-story building. And he's lived his entire life without really noticing the government or society. And his mother didn't send him to school. She homeschooled him. And his story starts when he receives his first tax bill. And he basically has to start taking part in society. And because he's new to it, he, will, uh, he questions everything. So every step he takes, he questions, why do I have to do this? Why does this happen? The story is told by uh, the narrator, who is the girl who delivers the mail. Um, and the, when I started writing this novel, I actually had a job delivering the mail in Amsterdam. So. So I was studying at Oxford University part time and in a side job uh, as a post girl delivering mail in Amsterdam East. And the east of Amsterdam is an area where uh, you have it's very multicultural. I think it's one of the most multicultural parts of Amsterdam. And you basically see just about everything that you can see in a society in one neighborhood. And I don't know how it is in Dhaka, but in the Netherlands, it's so that we uh, leave our curtains open a lot. So when the person who delivers your mail comes up to your house uh, or anyone else who comes up to your house, you can look straight inside. So I started to get to know a lot about the people in my neighborhood and also by the mail I was delivering. Some people were in debt, so they got big stacks of bills and other people, they didn't speak the Dutch language. So they asked me to translate the letters from the court or the police. So I was learning a lot about uh, what kind of people lived in my neighborhood and especially the people who were somehow really not really keeping up with society. And at the same time, I was in my 20s and everybody around me was starting jobs and trying to fit in in society. And I was doing internships through Oxford. And I was starting to realize that if you, if you don't fit in so well in a hyper-organized society, uh, it can be a lot of hard work to try to take part in it. And these people that I saw as I delivered the mail, they hadn't succeeded in taking part in it but not really because there was something wrong with them, but mostly because they were slightly different or uh, wanted a different type of life. And all these stories, they, um, the people I, I saw and the conversations I had, they started turning into characters in my mind. So I started to um, get these fragments of stories in my head of these characters that were waiting for their mail and trying to live their life. And I realized this could be a book. Uh, and the main character, Russ, would be this person. Hi, who would be at the center of it all, um, trying to uh, start his life 
in a modern society. So when, um, when this book came out, uh, I was really curious and it's kind of scary because it was my first book and the things that I write about, uh, they aren't things that I talk about a lot. So I was curious when the book comes out, how will people perceive it and what will they read into it? And um, I did a book tour of the US and the UK and I met a lot of readers in different places in the in the Midwest, in Chicago, Minneapolis, in LA. And it was kind of surprising to me that there were a lot of people who came up to me and said, oh, I relate to this character, or I'm like Mr. Lucas, or <laughs> I'm Russ, uh, even though we live in totally different countries and cultures. And to me, even though I was nervous before, it was a huge relief also to see, oh, there's more people like me. Um, we're a group of people. So in a way, the book um, worked as a, a connector for me and connected me to other people with a similar way of thinking. Um, and this inspired me in part to start uh, Turquoise. We started having uh, gatherings with people from different backgrounds and fields where we would, through a story, uh, introduce a topic that we would discuss. And we realized that people really wanted to connect with each other and uh, work on projects together, uh, mostly social projects across cultures and disciplines and that we could help each other out. So that was the beginning of, um, of what is now the Turquoise Foundation. It's the foundation that I uh, co-founded. And that's a little background about the book. Uh, I will start reading the first, the first chapter, it's called night this is in um this is written uh in the voice of the girl who delivers the post and even though it's the first chapter I, it was one of the last uh chapters that i wrote i wrote all the stories of all the characters first and then i realized i kind of need to take the reader by the hand and take them into that neighborhood where i'm telling the story and the girl who delivers the post is, is the one who takes them into this world. So here we go, the first chapter, a night. There you are. It's night now. And if you're coming to see me, you need to take the night bus, number seven, in the easterly direction. The city is dark and you'll see the yellow lights of the street lamps flash by behind your own reflection in the bus window. Canal Street, the driver announces in a tired voice. That's where you get off. The bus stop is on the bridge between the old part of the neighborhood with the low flats and the three-story houses and a new part with the glass apartment buildings and the construction sites. You see the boats rocking in the black water of the canal. The windows of the flats across the water are dark. It's late. But if you turn around towards that tall glass apartment building behind you and look up to the seventh floor, you'll see one window that is lit by a desk light. Behind that window sits a girl with a blonde ponytail. She's looking back at you. That's me. Down below, next to the front door, there's a list of all the people who live in my building. You press the buzzer that says Lucy, and my voice says, of course, I'm always here for you through the machine. You come into my room, you hang your coat over the chair and I'm sitting here by the window as I always am. Come stand next to me, I say. Then I point out the window. Do you see those flats and those houses across the water? I know everyone who lives there. I know every name and I know a lot of things about them too. In my profession, you get to know a lot very quickly. It's like I have been standing in a corner of their living room, so to speak. That is how I watch over them. There in that low dark flat right across from us, the light blue curtains on the fourth floor, that's where Mrs. Blue lives. I call her grandma in my mind sometimes. She's not my real grandma, of course, but she does look like one a lot. Her round wrinkled face lies like a multicolored raisin on the pillow. She always wears blue eyeshadow and wrinkled pink lipstick to bed. She's almost deaf. The white noise in the blue colored bedroom 
comes from a radio she doesn't hear. That radio has been on for almost a year now, just as long as Mr. Blue has been gone. He didn't switch it off when he left. One apartment to the right from Mrs. Blue's behind those white curtains lives the girl with the black hair called the secretary. At this moment, she's having the same dream she always has. The dream in which she's waiting for something. The clock you hear ticking so loudly is in the living room. Although he's, she's been here for almost a year now, she still hasn't unpacked any of her boxes. Her things only fill one tenth of her room. Next to Mrs. Blue and the secretary's building is a side street called Low Street. Do you see those old houses right at the beginning of that street? Squint your eyes and you'll see one fourth floor apartment on the corner. On this floor lives a young man who has no surname. His only name is Rust, after his father, a Russian sailor that he's never met. Rust too is sleeping, his short dark hair contrasts with his flowery sheet. There's something about Rust. Maybe it's the way he lies like a child on his belly, or maybe it's the soft features under his two day beard that makes him look like he's not fit for this world. In a few hours, you'll see the sun come up right over there, over the Halfords Hull Auto Center. One by one, the people in my neighborhood will wake up again. Alarm clocks will start ringing in the flats in the houses. People will walk docilely to their bathrooms. Curtains will open. Mrs. Blue will appear in the window over there. She always combs her hair by the window at seven o'clock. And I'll get ready too. I'll put on my royal mail trousers, my royal mail coat. I'll pull my ponytail through my royal mail cap. And you can stay here by the window. You will see me cycle down below by the canal toward the Royal Mail Center in the business district. There I sort out envelopes while my boss counts the days till his retirement out loud. And at 10, my round starts. Like every morning, I bring the letters and the bills and the warnings and the postcards shouting, hiya and good morning, left and right, waking up the lazy with my mailbox clatter. Oh, that's the first chapter. Um, and that's where I take the reader into this neighborhood that's never named, but a bit like Amsterdam with the bikes and the canals. Um, and I was hoping that one of you would like to read uh, a bit about Russ uh, next. So maybe uh, the first chapter on page three, uh, that's simply called Russ. Um, which is where he, he hears noises that indicate that something new has happened in his apartment. Um, who would like to read? Um, I could go, but I'm not sure. Kat, how are we doing the reading today? Are you going to be sharing something on the screen like usual? Uh, Katrina, you're still mute. Uh, I can share my screen or I can uh, I've shared the link, but I can hear. Is, is this a, no? Yeah, I can see it now. <clears throat> uh, you want me to go? Yes, please. <clears throat> okay, uh, just from the beginning then. Um, uh, Russ. Flap. Russ was lying in his tracksuit bottoms under his flowery duvet in his bed when he heard that sound for the first time. It had been an ordinary Thursday morning until the sound had rung out in his apartment, flapped, and disappeared again. I heard something, Russ said to himself under the duvet. It was a short sound, short, but very clear. He didn't move. I don't know if I've ever heard that sound before. He listened with deep concentration for a while, but his apartment was quiet again. This is unusual. He waited for a bit. I really should get out of bed and take a look. Russ opened his eyes and looked around the blackness under the duvet. He had just reached an extreme level of comfort under the covers, and he had spent a lot of time working toward it, patiently shifting and turning on the mattress. Therefore, Russ mumbled, therefore it will be wise to calmly consider whether I truly never have heard that sound before instead of jumping out of the bed like some police detective. One by one, Russ went over the sounds he could hear in his apartment. 
there was the sound of the rain, which sounded like really titty on his tin roof. There was the sound, there were the sounds of the trams in the main street that squeaked and squeaked when they braked. Uh, there was always some siren sounding somewhere in the distance, sometimes coming closer and sometimes fading away. Then there was the tick and the tack his wooden doors made, a drip from the tap and caw from the gull that nested in his drain pipe under the roof. Occasionally, there was a massive clang, bang, bang when someone dropped their trash from the balcony. And of course, there was the sound of the refrigerator, which sometimes said, Trrr. His neighbor on the ground, his neighbor on the ground floor had an alarm, alarm that he set off every Monday to test it. Some lonely drunkard trolled, uh, drunkard tr strolled through, uh, strolled down lo Low Street now and then, shouting, "Everything is going to hell!" I tell you. And there was a constant, uh, there was a continuous swoosh in the background from the cars. And last but not least, there was ding dong, a sound Russ had heard last winter when his doorbell had rung. No, Russ concluded, there were many sounds in his apartment, but flap wasn't one of them. Flap was a stranger, and when Russ pulled the duvet from his head, his suspicion that no good could come from this sound was confirmed. In the middle of the dark floor of his apartment, a bright white envelope had appeared. Slowly, Russ got up from the bed, put on a t-shirt, and walked towards the stainless white envelope that had intruded on his apartment. Does somebody else want to continue? If you, if you want to read, you can you, you can raise your hand e even beforehand, um, or you can just volunteer at this point. Does anybody want to read? Mm, I can. I, yeah, you can continue. Um, I continue, and yeah. let me know if somebody raises their hand then. Okay. Or if you want to read, let me like just interrupt me whenever. <laughs> Go ahead. Russ and the letter. It took Russ a long time to find the post office since he had never been there before. And it turned out to be the large orange, orange building next to the supermarket. <clears throat> it had a square hallway and the post office employees sat behind, the win behind windows on the opposite side of the entrance. Russ waited for a very long time until it turned out he had to get a number, of, a number from, the, from a poll and then he got it, and then he waited a very long time again. But now it was his turn. The woman behind the window had broad shoulders and red hair. First of all, Russ said, I'd like to return this. Russ held the letter in front of the window. Then he shoved it in the slot under the window toward the lady. Secondly, he continued, I wish to declare that I don't need any more mail ever. Please inform the postman. The woman behind the window lifted her eyebrows and smiled at Russ. After that, she took the letter, turned it around, shoved it back to Russ's side of the window. <clears throat> You're giving it back, Russ said. Yes, the woman said. Russ looked at the letter. He put his hands on the paper and tried to push it back in the slot, but the woman blocked it with her hands. I need the letter to go behind the window, Russ said. You mean in front of the window, the woman said. I'm in front of the window, Russ said, and I want the letter to go behind the window so that the window is between the letter and me. Um, if you could move your hands, please. You are behind the window, the woman said. I watched you fuss around with your tax bill behind the window like watching television. It is not my tax bill, Russ said. I never get bills. The woman brought her face close to the little holes in the window. When I'm at home, I watch the people behind my window, walking and driving down the street. One day I saw an old lady fall into the bushes. It took 15 minutes until someone helped her out of there. Nobody cares anymore nowadays. Madame, Russ said, bringing his face close to the window too. I just want to return this letter. I don't want it. It makes me feel nervous and unpleasant. And all I'm asking you 
is to take it back and tell the postman I don't need his services. Would you do that? The woman smiled at Russ. She smiled for a while without saying anything, as if there weren't a lot of people waiting with numbers. Sir, the woman said in eventually, the post is not sent by the post. It is sent by the sender. Ah, Russ said, I see. I apologize. In that case, please inform the sender that I don't want it anymore. He paused to think, all the senders. It's not possible, the woman said. If you knew what kind of things they say in this letter, Russ, le Russ replied, one moment I was in bed, not harming anyone, and the next moment I am bombarded with demands for this and for that and for money that I do not have. He was aware that he was yelling, but he couldn't stop. They threatened me in that letter. They say 2,615 immediately, because otherwise they will be forced to regretfully sell my bed and my kitchen and my clothes, and I don't need that. Um, and I don't want that. I need my bed and my kitchen and my clothes. Debt, the woman nodded. Most of our letters are about debt. You are funny to watch. When you get upset, you get red spots on your neck and you twist your face while you speak. But my lunch break starts now. The woman shoved her chair back and switched off the lights behind her window. Returning letters won't help you, she said. The letters are merely the way it manifests itself. I would read that letter very carefully and pay up. If you ignore it, something huge will be set in motion. What do you mean? What is, what is that thing that is set in motion? How do I see it coming? Russ asked, but the woman did not reply. She reached for her purse and rolled down the curtain, leaving Russ standing there, alone in the post office among the waiting people, who did not look at him, but at the screen that said the numbers. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, I was right about the daunting part because the whole time I was reading, I was very concerned about whether the tone I was reading it in is the tone that it was <laughs> meant to be read in. And the fact that like the person who wrote it could hear me read it. I was like, oh, I, I really hope I'm doing it justice. <laughs> and also it's it's um like this man who uh, he he like, in his mind, it's very simple. He's just trying to return a letter. And he doesn't like, it's interesting how this, the, the male woman, um, the woman at the post office doesn't immediately catch on. She, um, I can't quite tell why she's not tell, like, either she, like, either she thinks he's joking. Uh, like, she, I don't think she's caught on that he actually doesn't get why he has to read it or why he has to pay the bills. Um, so I found that interesting. Like, okay, uh, the first, also the first chapter that that was like really immersive. <laughs> it, it really takes you into the story. Thank you. I, I I love. I actually love how you read it. You did a really good job. It's also it's just wonderful to hear someone else read it. I, I enjoy that way more than reading it myself. And if you do. Uh, a decent job as a writer, then um, the, the text could be read by any voice. Um, and people, I always think about people who have this book at home, who have it on their nightstands and who are reading it in, in their voice, in their mind, with their images, maybe for what kind of post office they know or the type of woman that they see when they think of the post office lady. And there's not a lot of description in there. So I, I always hope that people in their imaginary uh, view of the story that they will bring in images from their own life. And I wish I could just watch what that looks like. And the thing that you say about how this woman reacts is it's interesting because I realized as I was delivering the mail, um, I wasn't required to uh, translate uh, or read uh, letters out to people or interact with them personally or answer questions about the mail that they got um, and actually I didn't really have time for it either but I did do it but the other people at the mail uh, thought it was kind of funny that I would have this personal connection with all the people who get the mail and I think the same is with the woman at the post office like she gets so many people there um, and she cannot interact with all of them personally. And this 
the thing that I found interesting when I was writing it was to that if I had a, a, a character like Russ who wasn't familiar with the proceedings of society, the things that we find really normal, um, I would have a character who would be questioning everything, like, for instance, which side of the window is in front of the window, but also why do I get the letter? Can I give it back? And part of this idea came into my head when I went to the city office myself in Amsterdam and I had a, a passport and it was, uh, when I picked it up, it was a new passport and one of the pages of the passport had a little tear in it. And I was informed at the airport that I couldn't use it like that. So I had to return it. And the lady behind the counter said, okay, you can return it. Uh, was your passport lost or stolen? Uh, and I said, it wasn't lost or stolen. I have it here, but it's damaged. Can you fill in damaged? And she said, no, we can fill in lost or stolen. Uh, and I said, but it, it's neither, it's, it's damaged. So could you add something to the system or say something uh, that it's a different situation? And she looked at me and she said, Madam, the system speaks a language that nobody understands. We have to speak the language of the system and we have to bend reality so that it fits in the system. And that really struck me. And I thought, oh, that, that happens quite a bit in society where if you're, so, if you're if a very organized society where everything is a, has a form and every, you have to be boxing, filling out categories, then things will get lost that don't fit into the category. And the woman who was working there at the city office that I spoke to I could sense that she was also a little bit frustrated with it, but she had really accepted it. She just said, the system speaks a language that we don't understand and we have to listen to the system. And that beautiful absurdity that's in there, I wanted to put that in the, in the chapters. And uh, I think you did a wonderful job reading. Thank so you thank so, you so much. much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for sharing that um, story because yes, that is, like a, that as you say it's a beautiful absurdity how we create these systems that are supposed to help us but then we end up falling under a system that doesn't quite do the whole job so it, that was like really great to have that insight of how you got to this part of the story kind of mind-blowing right now <laughs> how we can hear like the author's perspective of how they arrived at a point in the story yeah. like, just little awestruck. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm curious, can I ask you a question in the middle? What is, if you deliver the mail in the city where you live, the, could you look inside people's houses? Would people have the curtains um, open? Well, in Dhaka, one, we have, we don't have um, houses that are like on the, like, no, I, we, we don't have, um, we wouldn't generally be able to look into windows. Uh, primarily because we have very little, very few houses that have, um, that are on the same level as the, like on the level of the road, we have like huge buildings all the time. And if we were to deliver mail inside, you would usually deliver the mail on the ground floor to the person, um, to perhaps the security of uh, security personnel at the building. You wouldn't usually go door to door. Uh, the post person wouldn't go door to door, they'd just deliver it to the, uh, all the mail for a building would get delivered to the security uh, person who's operating like, the door or the gate of the building. So, um, and I'm not, uh, I think if somebody else is more familiar with the post system in Bangladesh, I've never personally delivered mail in Bangladesh, so I wouldn't be yeah. able to answer more than that. <laughs> Yeah, so we get it's it's very rare. Like the po the post just started like recently working really well, but before it was always like, am I going to get it? Am I not going to get it? But what other just to give context, like what other delivery do we get in Dhaka that comes that actually comes to the door? Not the chicken walla, not the fish walla. Like what? Who comes to our doors apart from our guards? I think I would like to add something, if you um, permit. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's a very nice question regarding the postman. And uh, in broadly in Bengal culture, I mean, uh, Dhaka is, I'm not focusing on Dhaka, 
what uh, previously uh, Rabita told that Dhaka is a bit complicated. It's true, Dhaka is always complicated. But if you look at the previous history of Bengal, I mean, when it was more or less the um, whole subcontinent together at that time, or, or uh, there is a lot of stories in, uh, of the postman and how they are interlinked with this and how they connected people to the different houses are very much prominent. One of the major writing of Rabindranath Tagore was the postman and uh, in, in his writing, we can see this, uh, how a postman able to build a nice relationship with uh, different household. So there are some stories, uh, but uh, as mentioned the day to day, we are getting more civilized or society is changing. So that this link between a stranger postman and the household is uh, day by day, it's decaying, uh, but it was there. It was there, there is a very strong bond of a village postman to the different houses. Yeah. Nowadays, the letters are just delivered. Uh, and uh, as you, uh, you had asked, I think one thing which gets delivered right to your door is we have a lot of catering, you know, home de uh, food delivery services. So that's one thing which gets delivered at the door. No, just... Unfortunately, the concept of uh, post office uh, in Bangladesh, it was um, and, uh, the service was not so good. Maybe it changes recently a bit, uh, it, it improved. But it was, uh, let's say, when there was no such uh, DHL or courier services available in, Bang in Bengal, mm. we had to, to completely rely on these services. So mm. they, have a go uh, they have a very quite good services, in fact. And uh, the person postman was some sort of a very um, iconic figure in Bengal literature and Bengal culture, uh, especially uh, if you look at some, as I mentioned, that uh, Rabindranath Tagore's one of the very nice pieces, uh, piece of work is Postman, and where you can see that how Postman is influenced uh, society, how Postman has a connection with the different person in the villages, and how this person not only delivering a, a letter or a post, but uh, how this person is uh, uh, connecting uh, different houses or uh, different families uh, together. It's a really nice piece of work. Yeah. So um, my system just delivered a, an email on my phone saying that I just do see. Right. Sorry. Um, no, no, I just ironically received a message that that my postman is, has just delivered a a parcel that I had ordered. Yeah, yeah that's so, really nice. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. The, think, the uh, universe is incredible. Yeah, we need to improve that services and government that, because it's still uh, uh, the post services uh, used to do a lot of other services uh, together, but they're trying to improve it, and I hope it will improve, and it will Pressure, be. Pressure. Yeah. It, it, it will, it will. There's no other choice. Um, I'm really glad that uh, Kobir Bhai um, introduced that perspective of the entire Bengal and how it used to be. Uh, like, I'm misinformed about that myself. Like, I don't know much outside Dhaka. So it's really nice to have that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's a bit complicated. What you mentioned is right in Dhaka, even we don't know when the one letter is coming in your mailbox in downstairs. Uh, we don't know, but uh, in Bengal or in the villages, you will see that a lot of uh, uh, link. It's interesting, yeah. That for me, it's fascinating because I, when I started reading this book, uh, when I did the book tour in the US, I realized when people asked me questions that this idea that the person delivering the mail would know so much about the person where they were delivering the mail was a bit strange to them. And they, they said, but how did you how would you see into their houses? And then I realized in the Netherlands, it's very normal. It's in our culture to uh, have the curtains open and to be to have your home life on display, basically. And it comes from <laughs> uh, it comes from a religion and culture where you wanted to show that you have nothing to hide, and maybe also show that you have a new kitchen or something or something nice in your house. But <laughs> if the uh, if a religious leader would be walking down your street, you would want him to see into your house and look for having dinner. Everything is normal here. And this kind of stuck in Dutch culture. And when we have tourists, uh, they often also notice this, that, that there's very little need for privacy in that sense. You can watch <laughs> it inside people's homes. And 
when I delivered the mail, also realized that if you go to a person's house every day at the same time, uh, whether or not they're there, you do notice a little bit about them. So if, if suddenly, um, if suddenly somebody's home who was normally never there, you you notice something, and especially the people who where something was happening. Um, for instance, there was one lady who was always kind of drunk, um, and one time she was asleep with her face in her handbag uh, on the sofa, and I wasn't sure what I should do because I wasn't sure if she was asleep or not. And I had a letter for her once and she had to sign it and she held it up against the wall. And instead of signing the paper, she accidentally signed the wall. Uh, so you, you have a lot of inside information. And I realized um, that I got a personal connection with them. And when the book came out, some people would ask me, um, Betta, why do you write about those weird people? Or why do you write about losers? And I was so surprised because I thought, I'm like those people. <laughs> uh, they aren't losers. I I'm pretty sure that they aren't. They're just people who don't fit in so well. And in the book, I really tr tried not to put the people on display who were struggling, but to actually question the thing that they had to do, normalcy. I tried to put normality on display and say, look, why do we have to? Why do we have to behave like this? Is this really necessary? Um, and and question this. So another uh, character is the secretary, and uh, she is she is only named once in the book. Her name is Laura, and aside from that, she's called the secretary. And when the book came out, came out, my uh, friends, uh, girls, they some of them accused me of writing about them. They said, "Why did you write about me?" And I said, I didn't, what do you mean? And they said, I'm the secretary. And I realized, oh, this character of this woman who is waiting for her life to start, who's doing everything right, but still the fairy tale isn't happening, uh, is very familiar. And I realized that uh, this is a, one of those stories that we tell, you know, you, you get your degree, you get your apartment, you get your job, and then this magical life will unfold for you. Uh, well, actually, it might not. Uh, it might need a little bit more effort. And there's, and for women, there's a little bit more danger in the world, actually. And there's uh, not always equal opportunities. And that's what I'm, what I'm exploring through this, uh, the character of the secretary, which wasn't actually was not based on uh, any of my friends. And maybe one of you would like to read uh, a section from the secretary. Uh, maybe. Let's see where she's in the office. Mm. Oh, the one at home, uh, page seven. It's called the secretary. If anyone would like to read it, maybe raise your hand and just say me. I'm really not judgmental on the reading style. I love hearing you read it. Anyone? Lubna? Are you a read aloud fellow? If no one wants to read, then I can. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. The secretary. The secretary walked into the hallway of her apartment. She hung up her coat and looked through the mail. It was all for Mrs. Blue, mostly funeral advertisements, which she put in the bin, and one postcard, which she kept. She'd been getting Mrs. Blue's mail for a while now. The post girl always put it in her post box when Mrs. Blue's was full. The secretary put down her bag and the card on the kitchen table. She wondered why Mrs. Blue never answered her door anymore and didn't pick up the phone. She did see her walking down the street sometimes, pushing her rolling walker to the supermarket. 
So there was no justification yet to use the emergency key she'd asked for them from Mrs. Blue when she'd moved in. The secretary sat down on the chair by the table. Rain was streaming down the kitchen window. She took her diary out of her purse and browsed through the empty pages. I see, she said, although there was nothing to see. The ticking of the clock echoed in the apartment. Well, well, the secretary continued for no reason. All right, then. She got up from the table and looked out the window. The post girl was cycling past the canal, trying to put her raincoat on while pedaling. The secretary took the postcard from the table. It had a map of a city on it and greetings from New York. Dear Ma, it read on the other side. How are you? I am sorry I could not make it for your birthday. Busy, busy, you know how it is. Please write me back, Ma. Everyone sends you the best. Glenn. Glenn was Mrs. Blue's son. She had seen his picture in her apartment. He was bald. Glenn, but his face looked friendly. There was a return envelope attached to the card with Glenn's address on it and a stamp. The secretary held it up in the air. The sun shone on the paper. It wasn't raining anymore. She filled a glass with water, drank it, washed and dried the glass and placed it back in the cupboard. Then she returned to the table and crossed out Ma in the postcard. Dear Laura, she read out loud. How are you? Uh, I think just go up a bit, yeah. Dear, how are you? I am sorry, I could not make it for your birthday. Busy, busy, you know how it is. Uh, please write me back, Laura. Everyone sends you their best. She repeated the sentence. Please write me back, Laura. A few times. It had been a long time since she heard someone say her name. The last one had been the manager during her job interview. Laura Zimmerman can come in, he said in a bored voice, the same voice her doctor used when he called her from the waiting room. She'd written her name on a contract that day, a contract that said Laura Zimmerman, here on referred to as the secretary. She remembered the manager taking the contract, putting it in a drawer and locking it. Since then, he called her secretary, or oh, my dearest secretary, when he needed his dry cleaning picked up. The secretary thought about her name, lying locked away in that drawer. It was as though it had been taken out of the air that day, which is a good thing, she reassured herself, a necessary thing. This will lead to things. Soon things will start, like they start for everybody. She paused for a little bit. Any moment now, she thought any moment now. She wanted to continue thinking about those things that would start any moment now, but she wasn't really sure anymore what she meant. There was a silence in her head and she sat quietly looking at the unpacked boxes and the white walls. Then she took the sheet of paper from her diary and wrote, Dear Glenn, thank you for your beautiful card. The birthday was wonderful. All is well. I have a job as a secretary and a spacious apartment. How are you? I think I'll keep it till there. Oh, the next is the tax bill. Is that the next chapter? Uh, it's the next chapter for uh, Russ, but maybe we can read the next chapter for uh, the secretary. That might be nice. So to stay with this one character, which would be, uh, let's see, the secretary at work on page 20. And that was beautiful reading. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the secretary at work. The secretary was sitting behind a desk in the overall company offices in the business district. In her lap, she held a plastic bag with a new dress for the office party. The office party would start at seven that day, and it was taking place in the office canteen. 
The dress she bought was sea green. She had bought it during the lunch break. She touched the fabric with her fingers. The lady at the shop said it looked stunning and she did not look away while she said it, which meant it was true. She was a nice saleswoman, the secretary thought. She'd asked the woman if she liked swimming, but she hadn't replied. The secretary pictured herself coming through the door at the office party, the heads of her colleagues all turning toward her as they whispered to one another. Is that the secretary? It can't be, but it is, it is her. The phone rang. Good afternoon, overall company. I'll put you through. The secretary pressed the forward call button on the phone and opened her diary. It had a mirror on the inside. Sorry, my date book is completely full, she said to her mirror self. Her mirror self did not answer. They looked at each other. The person in the mirror looked plainer and more distressed than the one in front of the mirror. It was three hours until the company party started. It is strange, the secretary thought as she looked at the clock above the glass corridor that the ticking of the clock doesn't really have anything to do with time. The hands are pushed forward by batteries, not by time. Although if time slowed down, the clocks would, uh, we have to put it up a bit. Yeah. Although if time slowed down, the clocks would slow down too, of course because time determines the speed at which everything goes forward. She studied her hands as she slowly moved them before her eyes. The people were walking down the corridor, were laughing and joking. The secretary pictured herself laughing and joking in her dress. She is great, people would say to each other. And then someone would ask her to go to a restaurant and they would be inseparable ever after. And if this person had to pick one person to be on an island with, it would be her without a doubt and, all, and the other way around. Yes, said the secretary. At first she did not know anyone, but after the office party, she was the one everybody talked about. So, uh, so can we, uh, shall we keep it till there? Or we continue. I think we can keep it. At, at, to me, it's uh, fine. Uh, okay. uh, I'm just. Uh, okay, I, I, just I love your reading. Of it. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to mention that bit about the time. You know, that was beautiful, beautifully expressed about the uh, 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 yeah, about the clock just moving because of the batteries, but not really aware of the time. You know, uh, so very beautifully. Beautifully expressed. I liked it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I I wrote some of this, so I I was doing um the the creative writing masters at Oxford, and part oh, of it was okay. an internship, and it, oh, it was okay. my only office experience. Oh. Right. Okay. Uh, very well. Uh, the descriptions come uh, through very well. And then I realized yeah. that a big part of office life is. Uh, I think yeah. we have a little delay. Um, a big part of office life is um, small talk and uh, fitting in the office uh, society, mm. fitting into the group and behaving uh, in a way that is pleasant for everyone, which mm. uh, has its own rules. And uh, right. small talk, for instance, talking about the clock and how time moves forward, it, that's not mm. small talk. That was nice, very well expressed. Thank you. Have you worked in an <laughs> office? I have I have retired now and I used to be an educationist. So I used to be principal of two schools. This was Scholastica and then mm -hmm. I was a head of uh, Chittagong Grammar School. Now I have retired and now I would, I, I, you know, that is why I'm really happy today to see so many young students who have joined here because you know uh, um, nowadays with the internet and with all the, uh, this reading books has uh, is you know sort of uh, going away 
And we used to always encourage the students and I'm so happy to see so many students are here today. I'm really happy to see that. And I think that's really cool too. I'm curious about the people who are here who are students, if they have had an internship yet or uh, as if they're doing a side job. Uh, I think they uh, uh, right now they're in the uh, school level. They haven't yet gone to high school. Once they go into high school, after that, the internship start in Bangladesh. And normally it's like that. Would people normally have a side job next to school or is that hard to say like in general? Mm. The school the, which they come from, Oxford, I don't think uh, it's like, it is like that. But there are other schools, maybe people do have side, uh, side you know, uh, mostly they would be tutoring others to get a sort of an income. But can you all say something? Do you, uh, I, uh, do any of you have a side job? Yes? Actually, Anyone? no, we don't have any yep. side job. Like we yeah. used to just do our education and in Bangladesh, I don't think we get that opportunity to do side job. Like as we're not that much older, that's why. Yeah, it's a, 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 they have quite a sheltered and protected lives here, you know, and late. Mm, I, I but heard they are, eighth grade and you know, they're grade different. Yeah, the yep. different schools and different, uh, yeah, the, the school which they go to, Oxford is one of the private schools and it's quite expensive. The parents can afford it and they can afford to have the, 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 their children just studying, you know? So that's uh, what it's like. Yeah, and to me, I'm curious about it because I realized that those, the side jobs that I had, which were when I was a, uh, I became mostly when I became a student. Uh, you get so at what age did you at what age did you start? At what age? I started start? when I was uh, fifteen. I started working in a in a clothing store oh, on Saturdays. Okay. That's kind of normal for a Dutch uh, mm -hmm. person to have like oh, a one. Over, over here, normally they would f uh, finish their schoolings. You know, the at least tw uh, twelve years of schooling. After that, uh, the, uh, they go on, once they go into the college uh, uh, and high school level, then uh, they do go into jobs um, uh, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, can we say something about this? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, I'm in school right now. I'm in uh, class nine. So, uh, like, basically, uh, like, nowadays, you know, like, people, uh, most youths, young students have these opportunities for them to earn money from them. Uh, just like you tell that uh, we study in Oxford International School and that's an international school and we have to spend so much money in it. Uh, there are other students who can also afford to go to school to uh, like earn mm -hmm. money for their um, like semesters or yeah, academics. Uh, sorry, um, so I'm really sorry about the sound. Um, okay, so yeah, I was talking about that, and then there is this like uh, university students, and then yeah, the age limit where we have uh, like nowadays we can work in online like blogging or other things, and then we can also do teaching stuff. Uh, I mean, teaching students, uh, whether yeah. it's like uh other activities or yeah extracurricular activities for uh, maybe our interests and maybe for yeah earning money for our education yeah a lot of students they do they teach uh, teach others you know and that's uh, one uh, sort of income again i would like to add something uh, <laughs> is that uh, you know what uh, other uh, other um, participants said is very nicely that in Dhaka, part-time these students from a good uh, background of English or other languages or in a good education system get the opportunity to do some kind of uh, private tuitions of this kind of things to earn money. Otherwise, in general, there are no such part-time job 
uh, what you mentioned available in Europe and or other first world countries is not exist due to so many reasons. But first of all, we don't have enough job opportunity. This is the main reason I would say. Secondly, the culturally, we grow up or brought up like that, that this is the parents or family responsibility to build the children up to a mature age to face the professional life. But, but there is an irony in that, in that when we and uh, from the villages, for example, they, mm -hmm. they are working. For example, they are working their father's field, but they are not getting any paid. But they are contributing somehow to the overall economy of the family. For example, they go to field to give support to the to their parents, or uh, he's, he or she is supporting her mother to rearing some chicken or cows or something like that. So this kind of uh, contribution of labor yeah. uh, they are not uh, they are not paid directly but they are they are contributing to the economy of the household uh, so this kind of picture is very much available but not like the way you mentioned uh, or what is existing in western world to get the opportunity uh, to you know, directly work or do some kind of internship this is really really difficult to get even after completing the uh, university degree the internship facilities are not so still not very well established or well, well, well systemized because sometimes, sometimes some people get the opportunity to uh, or internship. Otherwise, it's very difficult to get even a better internship in Bangladesh now. Mm, thank you for explaining that. That's interesting to me because I realized that True, the little, the jobs that I do on the side, I learn a lot about, you get a... a People. A, yeah, yes. an internship, you get a dip into another world. So I've worked as a social worker and uh, mm -hmm. other types of jobs just two days a week. And as a writer, in the beginning, mm -hmm. I also had to uh, support myself with extra jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm lucky that they were available and but also it informed my writing to be able to see these other worlds and how people live and uh, meet mm -hmm. different people than uh, writers it's and art. Uh, and it's interesting for me to see how that is different everywhere. And I'm curious right. if there are, are there writers among the students here. I'm pretty sure there are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. what, how does that work for you when you've uh, written a short story or a poem? Uh, to be very honest, it's really complicated. I mean, even if your <laughs> family doesn't support you, at mm -hmm. the end of the day, <clears throat> everybody try to mock you that, okay, what it will be after uh, by doing this writing, how you will survive? This is the key mm -hmm. first question. Uh, and the, the very uh, reality is that because uh, the way we <clears throat> recognize uh, a person um, potential in this society, particularly in Bangladesh, is to how this person is doing a job or how this person is doing a business and how he's earning. So in terms of any creative work, uh, this, this scope is very, very low. So for example, a young writer, he still doesn't know how he will or she will publish uh, his or her writing but he's interested to um, do some writing and do some practice. And then it's a mm -hmm. continuous effort and it's a continuous uh, practice is required. So this kind of facility is very, very limited for a writer, for a painter, for a musician, uh, for a country like Bangladesh. For sure. And I would just like to add that that's actually like exactly what I went through because I am a software engineer and a writer and it gets like, the society here gets in like it gets ingrained into you so deeply because I could have just chosen writing as a profession, uh, but the society I am, have been brought up in doesn't really support that. Uh, so even though like I do write even now, I will always like I think even if I grow up and like no matter how old I get, I will always be like okay, so I write, but I will always need another practical or quote like a practical profession as well. Um, and that's, that's, that's really cool. interesting yeah. how, yeah. yeah, how it like gets ingrained in your system that writing alone can't be your profession. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how a lot of people, um, feel here because we don't see that yet as a full profession sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, but I would like to add here that the situation is, uh, much better now in recent years, 
because there have been many like there are many english uh, newspapers which have come out so i know many students uh, who were my students also so they used to write in the newspaper and after the uh, new, uh, after uh, writing and it would come out in the weekly the the children's section and then later on now these students are editors uh, of magazines and all uh, uh, in uh, they are al already in the field as journalists so this is one thing which has come up and then in recent years we have got a group like of uh, uh, people who have been coming out of english medium and they are writing so we have uh, bangladeshi writers writing in english and we've been having the dhaka literary uh, fest you know where uh, uh, from all over the world writers would come and also bangladeshi writers bangla write, uh, writing as well as english writing the books would be launched so we we've, we've been having that for the last 10 years so that has created some opportunities also i would like to say Yeah, I, I would love to come to the Dhaka. Uh, let's yeah, just, uh, let me I plan to come, but then uh, yeah. COVID happened, so maybe next yeah, year. Yeah, with the COVID, yeah. Yes, just, you should come. I would like to come, and I'm Again. just, I'm also asking it because I know that when I was uh, starting to write, uh, even, I don't, the question of how do you make money is also in the Netherlands. It's there, right. Yeah. Really quickly, but there's, there's a lot of discouragement. Mm -hmm. Uh, in general, uh, and you have to believe in in the story that you have. And if you, if most people, if they're a writer, the story will keep resurfacing, and you have to just write it down, mm. and then take the next step of sharing it with the world, which can be really scary. Um, right. But I just wanted to give the sense of a, a encouragement as well. To me, the, the character of the secretary is, is about that. If the yeah. world doesn't take you seriously, it doesn't mean that you mm. shouldn't take yourself seriously and that you shouldn't go for it. So I was hoping that maybe one of you would like to read uh, the the chapter where the secretary is at the doctor. Uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, I put a thingy in there, but it fell out. Do you have it, Katerina? Is it 40, 47, yeah, it's called, 48? Yeah, it's called Dr. Kroon. I think it's 47. Yeah, there it is. So in the PDF, it's a little bit different. So just give me, give me a second. But, oh, there it is, Dr. Kroon, yeah. Who wants to read? Anyone? I would like to read the white light, this chapter. It's really interesting to me. Absolutely, go for it, please. <laughs> okay. There he was, our Ras, floating in the water, looking at the lights of the city he thought he would feel at home in. From the water, the city looked much, much friendlier. Lights make places seem a lot warmer, he thought. And then he thought it was a strange thing to think about from the position he was in. The water was not cold. It folded like a blanket around him and there was a current that pulled his feet, carrying him along. Ras thought of Wanda in the light of the bedroom. He thought about the headlights of the manager's car in the park and the sounds Wanda made in her sleep. The water went into his nose and his ears. His clothes made him heavy. He floated almost out of the city now, floating faster and faster, it seemed. The seagulls flew and crowded above him, and Ras remembered his mother saying that seeing seagulls meant you were close to the sea. The water in his mouth <laughs> tasted salty and sweet. So His mother's stories about angels come to mind now and how he held his hand when she did. He thought of Francisco, his only friend, who had promised to save him, but it was all lies. He was all alone. He was not fit for his world, Ras knew now. He was not smart enough. He was not strong. 
the current pulled him faster and faster toward the sea. They say that when you are on the right track, everything suddenly goes very easily. The man at the airport had said, they say that it feels like sliding down a water slide. Yes, Ras thought in the water. It was true after all. At the end of the river, the water opened into ocean. Ras saw the wild blue view just before he went down. The current pulled him under breath anymore, and he swallowed the water that now tasted only of salt. Like a baby, he sank in the water, his arms spread out wide, his legs too, just as bright white light entered his returns, and Rush thought, this is, this is it. A, a low, steady sound came from the distance was traveling over the water towards, uh, toward him. Was it the voice of God? It wasn't. These voices sang, da, 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 kak, dila, am, pekta. Raf male voice sang, ras kicked in the water, Francisco song. He looked out over the waves and saw the black heads of the submarines sticking out above the waves above the water in the harbor, not too far in the distance. A light shone behind one of the window and the voices sang, try fest dobri katsa, toward, toward him, rush, toward him, rush gaps in the water. It was true after all, a wave washed over rush and it was black around him. Wazikas, uh, he said, underwater stuff. And he kicked and kicked until he reached the surface again, the waves crashing into his mouth. Francisco, he shouted, I am here. He started kicking and look of his coat in the water, letting it sink away in the sea. And kicked and kicked until he got above water and began swimming towards the submarine. The waves crashed over him and he tried to crashed over him and he tried to keep swimming and shouting. And when he came up for the last time, every close to the boats, very close to the boats, he saw a flashlight shine in his eyes. He heard a familiar familiar voice say, Well, well, Ras, finally. I think I'll stop here. Hello. I have a question can just really quickly. This pectopa, is it because you read like Cyrillic read, uh, when you read restaurant written in Cyrillic, but you read it as English letters, then it reads as pectopa? Is that yeah. what it is? So, sorry, I didn't hear you clearly. Um, so, you know, uh, Russian, and maybe Betha, you can explain a little bit the connection between your, your main character and, and the vast and desolate land that is Russia. Um, but he, he keeps saying this word, pektopa. Yeah. And um, in Cyrillic, if you read that, it reads as restaurant, which is restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why you chose that word and what it means to you and why he keeps he keeps saying it. Uh, that's a good question. And I love that you, that you guessed it because um, I was in Russia with my mother and uh, the alphabet was uh, undecipherable for us, but we knew the word restaurant, pectopa, but we read it out loud as pectopa. Um, and then I came up with this, Francisco is uh, Russ's friend in the book, and he's kind of a shady character, and they meet in the street when uh, Russ is at his lowest point, and then there's this guy who suddenly emerges, who's a bit of a, a bit of a hustler, maybe a bit of a con man. His name is Francisco, but when Russ says that his father is Russian, and he's never met his father, Francisco says he's Russian too. Um, but he doesn't quite have a Russian name. Um, and the Russian song that he comes up with is uh, how I would speak Russian if I knew a little bit. And that's how he, he kind of convinces Russ 
uh, that he's a Russian, uh, but still they have a, an actual real friendship uh, in a way uh, that Francisco steals from him, but he's also kind of nice to him and they connect. And that's what I, the type of character that I wanted to portray, portray through uh, Francisco, that the type of people you can meet in the street who are in, at one point stealing some money from your pocket, but on the other hand, could be the, the most fun person you've met in a long time. Um, so that's the, mm. the Francisco background. And I'm kind of curious now uh, for, I see that your name is Kabir, is that right, Kabir? Yeah, oh, yeah, yes, right? please. Yeah. Why did you pick this uh, piece? And thank you for reading it. It was a joy to hear this. Uh, but why did you select this one? Uh, first of all, I didn't go through all the chapters, uh, but quickly what I have um, what I have gone through this these few things that the, it looks like that Ras he passed through a lot of challenges in his life, and uh, at the end of the he had he got some realization uh, on him, and he finds something some learnings, and it reflects in this in this uh, piece of writing, I think that he has some writings, uh, he has some learnings, he got some learnings and he realized it at the end. Uh, so that seems very interesting to me. Thank you. For me, this, the ending, as some people thought that when Russ found Francisco again in the submarine, they thought it was a dream and other people thought it was real. And as, when you're the writer, everybody always wants to know. So is mm -hmm. it real? What is the real ending? And I don't want to say it because it's the, it's actually an, a little bit of an open ending for me too. I don't know if Ross is hallucinating it or not, uh, but I do know he, in this last bit, she, he says, I, I, I'm not fit for this world. I didn't make it, I'm not strong. But then he basically lands in another world, another layer of society where he does fit in, where he does uh, connect to people and where being an outsider is fine because they're all outsiders together. And that's an uplifting note that I wanted to add to the book and also just to emphasize that there are so many uh, that the people who don't fit in or yeah. who feel mm -hmm. a little bit like an outsider that they are with many uh, mm -hmm. and they could make a big, big group <laughs> if they wanted to. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of realization came into him that one line that it was true after all. Uh, some something he was thinking or he was dreaming or um, it came to um, came true at the end. Yeah, it, the, the, what is true after all is that a lot of people had told him his mother kept him away from school and she was hoping that he would go to sh shipping school. Uh, but he was seasick, so he couldn't go to shipping school and his mother gave up on him a little bit. But the message that he'd gotten all along was, you don't fit in, you won't succeed. And this is where he realized it was true after all. But there's also uh, other layers of society where he can give it a try. And in the book, what returns uh, is for each character, for the secretary, for the, the boy who delivers packages, Ashraf, um, for uh, Russ, there is society places a huge expectation on them. They say you are this person, you are this person. This is how you will behave. This is how your story will go, and they're all kind of swimming against the current. And for the instance, for the secretary, and also for Ashraf, the the boy who delivers the packages, they keep swimming against the current, and they they are gonna tell their own story and define on their own what their life is gonna be. And that's something that I wanted to put into the book because I think it's something that people all over the world experience through family, through society, through school, that your story might be laid out for you. People will say, this is who you are. This is what you will be doing. And they don't even mean it in a bad way or to oppress you, but your story might be really different but then you would need, then we will have to do some swimming against the current and it will take more energy than to follow the, yeah. the path mm -hmm. laid out for you. Mm -hmm. so yeah. In Russ's case, he ends up basically underwater in Russia um, and the secretary ends up 
uh, rethinking her life and finding love in a different way than she expected. It's a really nice, hopeful note. Would anybody else like to read? I think uh, we're coming to the end of the session. But if, uh, if anybody else wants to read, we can do one more. But this is also a good place to Stop. That was a that was a lovely note. Better. Uh, for me, it's fine either way. I think we just um, Gabby uh, read the, um, one of the very final chapters. Sorry, Eddie. No, I just wanted to um, ask you. I mean, how did you get into writing? What made made you? Uh, have you always had it, or did it come later in life? I always wrote stories and as a little girl, oh. I remember that if I had a fight with a friend about something and I didn't mm. know if I was right or wrong, uh, I would turn it into a little story. I would change the characters into a okay. and a dog okay. or something. Okay. And, that, and that's how I solved uh, problems in my life. And that's how I, if I didn't understand something, I would turn it into a right. story. Okay, that's good. So I always okay. did it. And then later, mm -hmm. what we've talked about becoming, having a career as a writer is, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I'll be alone at my laptop a lot, which is actually true. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was a bit worried that it would be a very lonely profession. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, if you're a bit further down the road, it turns out that it's not lonely at all. Like I'm talking to all of you now. Right, absolutely. <laughs> and we're having meaningful conversations that are, uh, okay. that are honest and and uh, and kind of deep. So in a way, this fear that I had for a lonely laptop life didn't uh, luckily come mm. true. Right. Okay. Thank you. So my uh, um, my instinct to invite you to to read um, with us in Dhaka, um, I had you know I was a little bit worried because the your your novel is it's it's there's so much a, a space in it and our city is is not is not the city where your characters live. Um, it, it's very different. And then like today's questions as you're asking us about the postman and then the jobs, you realize how different, how, what the contrast is. But, um, but I, th I think that there's always like underlying uh, commonalities that we find through reading. And, uh, and it's beautiful, um, I think, to, to read um, from the perspectives of women always, even though gender in your book I'm, I'm, is, is, not, is not the main um, theme, but it's still lovely to see like the, the sensitivity that, of descriptions and, uh, and, the, and the love that you have for these characters that they're so like so helpless in a sense, um, but, but who still, you know, persevere and make it to Russia and make it to new understandings of love. Um, so uh, thank you for, for bringing it to us and for sharing it with us and also like your, your backstory and what, and what gave birth to these characters in the story. Um, uh, we hope to see you. I'm frozen. Get frozen. Yeah. Now, now we can. Okay. Shoba, you can continue if you want. I'm frozen. But we can hear you. We can oh, uh, okay. speak. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to say we hope to see you at the Lit Fest when it does when it does come around and if. Um, 
If anyone has anything to add or, or questions or comments, please go ahead before we end this session. Oh, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay, so actually it's not, not a question. I want a suggestion from ma'am that in between this lockdown uh, and like six months or uh, from six months, I'm planning a story. Like I have the, all the plot in my mind, but actually I'm not getting the way through which I could start the introduction of the story. Like every time I write, try to write an introduction, I think like, no, I can make it more better, more effective. So I just want to know short stories and do you mean by introduction the first uh, part of the story where you start the story actually like i mean the first chapter you may suggest like from where we introduce the characters or in a slow way we move on to the main plot of the story yeah um that's a good question it's something that i actually had to learn how to do as well my my personal advice would be to start at a part of the story that you can totally picture and that you know very well. So don't start at the beginning. I know so many writers who go back to the beginning and there's something that writers sometimes say is that the first sentence of the book is the very last sentence that you will write. Because the beginning is the most technical part of your story. This is where you have to um, introduce everybody you have to put a lot of information in there but it also has to be enticing so people keep reading so it's a very hard place to start so i would always start a little later where you know where the action is and where you um a, a part that you will enjoy writing as well and maybe um it can be tempting to write the beginning of a story uh, by introducing people one by one, but you can also write, put a little bit of action at the beginning that doesn't contain a lot of information, just one paragraph. So how long is your story going to be? Do you think? How like, it's a short story. Like, I was quite inspired by Sherlock Holmes. So it's like a detective and they were in a crew, <laughs> like in a ship. So they were tracking some people, but they were like cl quite close to their success but however due to some disasters they unfortunately did not meet their success and like that it ends and the main part was there between the girls the interaction like they were two sisters not sister but they were best friends mm -hmm. but like in that crew eventually they in childhood they have an accident but like they lost their parents through the ship like it was a story quite sad and now they're here to track again uh, the people in the ship like in the they were detecting them but again there was hard, like there was the sadness in them but they have to win they have to success and they were quite close to their success but due to some problem they didn't meet it and that's how and there are so many parts but i don't want to spoil it so that's all it sounds like you have a lot of your story mapped out and you have a real arc there. So I think one of the crucial things for a beginning is that there's something in there that is juicy that will keep the reader going. So uh, mm -hmm. I would have a, a little bit of dialogue, uh, a, maybe a, a part of a secret, something you would like to know. And then um, make sure that the, the reader knows write down a couple of questions that you want the reader to have answered after the first chapter. So who, who are we? Where are we? And what is the main question that, what is the main story of this detective or what is the secret or what do we want to know? So, and then make sure that you tick those boxes. And that would be my advice. Um, but I, I know that it's different for everyone, um, but you can leave it till the very last bit. I hope this was a little bit helpful. Yeah, sure, I'll apply it. And thank you very much for your advice and the session. Thank you. Thank I have you. The one quick question. I, perhaps you already. Sorry, I perhaps you already answer uh, answer it. Why you choose the character name Ras? Mm, she is. Uh, good. Why did I choose the character name Ras? Um, 
not to any other name virus what are the reason behind uh, how you feel why you feel about it yeah um well russ's father was a russian sailor that his mother uh she forgot his name and they only oh. met a couple of times and uh in dutch the word russ means russian okay. and it's a it's a name that isn't known uh that much but i just liked it because it Russ, Russ is such an outsider. He's, he's a foreigner in a sense in every situation where he is. So I thought if I called him Russ, then he or even in his name, he carries, carries this uh, foreign feeling. So okay. that's why that's why I chose the name. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mm. Katrina has a problem, internet problem. So, uh, is there any other question we have to? Uh, Sharmin, yes. uh, this is to the Go Goethe Institute. Yes. Uh, how can we get the book? You know, the, uh, the, the book, how will it be available? Uh, you mean this book? Yeah. Okay. So, now we. Because we're... I would like to then recommend it to my club, you know, my book club. Okay. So for, that's great. For reading. Yeah. That's great. So how uh, will we get? Uh, what we can do, uh, I will talk with the library. Uh, so they will uh, suggest something def definitely. And then I will share with the reading circle. Is okay. that okay? Okay. Okay. okay? okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. But it is wonderful to have you here, Betty. <laughs> it was wonderful to have you here. And we hope that you will be able to come to Bangladesh <laughs> once all uh, things become normal and we will be able to see you. I hope so. I hope you will all come and say hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, definitely. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this and it was wonderful meeting you. And if, th if there's any last questions, I'm still here. I think Tarin has uh, raised her hand. Tarin, do you want to say something? Uh, Tarin okay. is having problem with the sound. Yes, unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Um, sorry, Tarin, we cannot hear you. Maybe you can uh, type your question in the chat. Yes, yeah. Uh, Shiti, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I don't really have any question, but uh, I want to say something about reading, writing, literary activities. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh. I'm. I think this story uh, about Russ is very interesting and is very inspiring. And yeah, I'm. I really want to read this book right now. Um, uh, like, um, Shawam is, uh, in sorry, we cannot hear you, Shiti. Can you, um, uh, say again? Okay, maybe there is a, yeah, Shiti, we cannot hear you. Can you, can you, uh, say a Okay, maybe there is connection problem. So, I think there's some technical problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I think we got that in question. To, your microphone is mute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, fine. Thank you so much. So uh, I think we do we have more any question more to Bethe? No, probably. Really. I think that's all. Yeah. <laughs> so thank I would you like so to. Much. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. And it was amazing. And like the, the even the little bits of the book that we read, I'm sure everybody here wants to like get their hands on it right now, because it's, it's that kind of book that really makes you want to like dive into it as soon as possible once you hear like a little bit of it. So I'm really, really um, honored to have been able to experience this with everyone here. Yeah, thank you, Robita. Thank you. Thank, thank you for being here. And, thank uh, you. Well, thank you. It was a great session. 
It was a great session. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you, Thank so you much. very you much. You all the best. And Tarina and Siti, you can always send them a message to uh, Katarina, maybe or Shoma, uh, if you want to say something. And yes, thank so you so much. Tarin already has uh, written that. Sorry, I'm. I seem to have some issues with my mic. I wanted to simply introduce myself as I couldn't earlier, but never mind. Thank you for the book and your additional stories. It was wonderful. Thank you, Tarin. Thank you so much. Uh, and also, we can see Katrina is here. Katrina, can you hear us? <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're already uh, about to close. Thank you, Betty. Thank you very much. And we hope that we will see directly, not in the internet, too. <laughs> you will come Bangladesh, we hope. Thank you very much for joining today. Thank you, everyone. Thank I you. hope so. I look forward to it. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. And thank you for being there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.